I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. The past has captivated me since I was a boy. Now I travel through time for a living. In this series, I'll seek out the men and women who made a difference. And so the legend grew. Sparked revolutions. That's when the mutiny occurs. And met adversity head on. I want to shine a light on the moments when history changed forever. Imagination rules the world. So said the renowned French ruler, Napoleon Bonaparte. And like many great leaders before and since, he sought to leave an impression through art. Because whether it's a scandalous painting that inspired a hundred-year love affair, a 21st century filmmaker that transformed his hometown, or a pioneer on the front line, the impact of art on history is more powerful than you might think. My first time travel is taking me back to the 1940s to meet a woman who dared to challenge the status quo. The little town of Harndorf in South Australia is very special because it contains the studios of not one, but two of the country's most important artists. Beyond there is the studio of Hans Heysen, the celebrated landscape painter, and in here is the studio of his daughter. And the story of her life, particularly during the Second World War, I find incredibly fascinating. Look, here she is, take a look at that. Nora Heysen. Born in 1911, Nora was a trailblazer. At 27, she became the first woman to win Australia's premier art award, the Archibald Prize for Portraiture. What was the reaction of people to the fact that a woman had won it? Well, <laughs> there was a furor in Sydney. Max Meldrum, who was another one of the contestants who'd won it before, was absolutely beside himself because a woman had won it. And he, he was quoted in newspapers all over the place saying, a woman should be in the kitchen, a man should be in the studio. <laughs> if Meldrum was furious then, he would have been positively apoplectic in 1943, when Nora became Australia's first female war artist. Initially, she wasn't sent to the front line. Initially, when she took it up in October, uh, she was posted to Melbourne, what was called the Military History Headquarters. And her job was to paint these utterly fearsome women who were heads of the women's services, like the entire army nurses in the Pacific. And one of them, Matron Annie Sage, recognised Nora Hyson's you know, talent and skill and passion and arranged by April the following year for her to be in New Guinea. Officially, Nora was supposed to capture the role of women at war. But there was only so much this artistic rebel could do with drab khaki uniforms. So she started to paint the men, but also she painted oh, this is lovely. women it's dancing. Dance in the sisters' mess. That's right, because she thought war has many aspects and one of them is relaxing. Yeah. So she was painting the nurses dancing. Sent it back and all hell broke loose. Well, she was actually reprimanded for painting nurses at leisure. They wanted to see them earnestly doing what they're meant to be doing. Now, this is the kind of stuff that she really wanted to do. She said being a war artist did strange things to her because she found herself in a cap and gown working in, she said, the sterile atmosphere 
of ether and whiteness, whiteness referring to the whitewashed walls. And she did a deal with the surgeon because before that, she was working outside in the, you know, the blazing heat of the New Guinea sun. And she said to the surgeon, if I do a drawing of a sister or two for you, can I work in the operating theatre? And so she, that actually became her studio for quite a while in New Guinea. She had to find ways around the army system. Yeah. I mean, the army were actually quite inflexible and here was an artist wanting to do what she was meant to be doing. But it was hard for her, wasn't it? Oh, I yes. mean, it's, uh, her yeah. relationships with the nurses initially weren't that good. Initially, she said they resented the fact that she was a captain. She had pips on her shoulders and she said they'd been through all kinds of warfare in the Middle East and she'd just landed there basically as a captain. So they resented that. It wasn't resentment or red tape that finally defeated her though. A severe skin reaction led to her being sent to North Queensland where she painted scientists searching for cures for tropical diseases. Do people recognise the quality of her work? It took until the 1980s, in fact, the late 1980s, early 1990s, for people to suddenly realise they had a top portrait painter. And it's taken people years and years to get used to the fact that a woman could be a war artist. While some artists find the recognition they deserve, others try to hide their involvement entirely. On my next time travel, I'm heading back to the 1930s to uncover the identity of a man who simply desired anonymity. At the height of the Great Depression in Sydney, working class suburbs were doing it tough. But amidst the desperation and destitution, a ray of hope emerged that would one day light up the whole city. It started with a mystery. From 1932, Sydney Siders saw their city covered with a single word by a phantom graffiti artist. The public became obsessed with discovering the identity of the author. It was an enigma that wouldn't be solved for 24 years. And it all began here in Woolloomooloo. I'm at the top end of Palmer Street now on the corner of Burton Street and it was here that a lot of people reckon a little miracle took place. 45-year-old Arthur Stace was just another man down on his luck. Born into poverty, he was a thief and an alcoholic in and out of jail. But then he had this incredible overnight conversion to Christianity. And about six months later, he was in this church, the Burton Street Tabernacle, and he heard the preacher say, I wish that I could say the name eternity on every street in Sydney. And Stace came out and he thought, well, I could do better than that. And he dropped to his knees and he started to write the word eternity. What is so extraordinary about this is that up to that moment, he had been almost completely illiterate. He couldn't have spelt the word eternity, let alone wrote it. But after this, in magnificent copper plate, much better than the rubbish that I'm doing, he continued to write the word eternity throughout the streets of Sydney. In 1956, Arthur was finally caught in the act, and his identity was revealed to the public. The mystery that had baffled Sydney for nearly a quarter of a century had been solved. By the time he died, they reckoned that he'd written it over half a million times. Decades later, Stace's simple message was broadcast around the world during Sydney's Millennium Fireworks display. Stace said he chose the word eternity because it makes them think. And that's exactly what great art should do. But if an idea or a word can change the way people think, can a painting do the same thing? I'm now heading back in time to when a scandalous piece of art turned a society's conventions upside down. Melbourne 
in the 1880s was booming thanks to the Victorian gold rush. In just a decade, the population had doubled and for a time, it was the second largest city in the British Empire. But while some people clung tightly to their prudish Victorian values, a more progressive way of thinking appealed to others. In 1880, the International Exhibition came to town and along with it, a prize-winning collection of European art. Amongst the works was a painting so mesmerising that a local doctor bought it and gave it to the National Gallery of Victoria to put on display. But there was a problem. What was the fuss all about? Well, here she is, Chloe, in all her naked glory. Isn't she fantastic? There is... I think something a bit odd about this arm going on, but apart from that, it's such a delightful picture. In 1882, the gallery started opening on Sundays, making it much more accessible to the general public. But Melbourne's newfound modernity could only stretch so far. It wasn't that the artistic elite of Melbourne thought that they shouldn't be allowed to see her because, of course, they would be inspired and ennobled by all this loveliness. What concerned them was working-class people having a look at that. What on earth would it inflame them to do? Debate raged in the local Argus newspaper. Chloe cannot be admired by a brother and sister together nor by a father and daughter. And a picture which thus scatters a family party is out of place in a collection. A matron. After just three weeks, Chloe was withdrawn from exhibition. But she wouldn't be hidden from public gaze forever. In the year 1908, there was this ex-gold digger entrepreneur called Henry Figsby Young who bought this pub, renamed it the Young and Jackson Hotel. He acquired Chloe for 800 quid. I'd buy her for 800 quid, wouldn't you? He put her up on the wall and she's been here ever since. Megan, do people still come here just to have a look at her? Yeah, they come every day. Was there a real Chloe? It was not a real Chloe, but there was a model that sat for Chloe. Uh, her name was Marie. She was a French artist model. Um, she, uh, she was 19 when she was painted, but at 21, um, apparently having fallen in love with the artist, at her 21st birthday, she boiled up a concoction of sulphur matches, drank the concoction and died. Why did she do that? Unrequited love. Apparently she'd fallen for the artist Jules Lefebvre. He'd announced his uh, engagement to her sister, whose name was ironically Chloe, and she was just devastated. Oh, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I mean, you wouldn't myself. turn down somebody like that, <laughs> would you? How could you? Well, I'll finish my pint quietly at the bar, which will give you guys time to have another look at Chloe. For over a century now, Melburnians have taken Chloe to their hearts. So much so that the National Trust of Victoria has decreed that she must never be separated from the pub or its people. Chloe challenged the social mores of the time. But it's not the first or last piece of art to influence the way people think. I'm now travelling forward to one of the world's more wacky eras, the 1970s, for an artistic revolution that kicked up a real political stink. I'm in Canberra to relive the heady days of the Whitlam era, when Labour's radical reform agenda turned Australian society on its head. In 1973, the government began building the National Gallery of Australia. And to fill it, they wanted the very best modern art. In there, there's a painting that's absolutely huge and it completely dominates the gallery that it's in. It's so colourful, energetic, vibrant, swirls all over the place. It's called Blue Poles and it was painted by the abstract expressionist painter, American guy called Jackson Pollock. Pollock was the darling of the modern art world. In the 1940s and 50s, he threw out the painting rule book and began pouring house paint straight onto the canvas in an attempt to capture the complexity of the unconscious mind. 
I could take you inside to see it, but an unexpected encounter has given me an even better idea. My friends from the Ainsley Primary School. Hi, guys. Hi. They have said that they're prepared to paint a version of blue poles. You've all seen blue poles, haven't you? Yes. And so I want you either to paint it just like you actually saw it or how it inspires you, how it makes you feel, OK? Yes. And the best one we'll show on the telly, right? Yes. You ready to go? Yes. One, two, three, get painting! Oh, Right, that's got them started. Now, let me tell you, when this painting was first bought by Australia in the early 1970s, there was a huge fuss about it because it cost $1.3 million. And at the time, the guy who used to buy paintings for this place was only allowed to spend $1 million on each painting. Anymore, he had to ask the permission of the Prime Minister, who happened to be Gough Whitlam. So he bought it, and immediately there was a huge furore from among those people who hated Gough Whitlam, and also from those people who didn't like modern art. Now, it is possible to criticise the Whitlam government, but in this case, he got it absolutely dead cold right. This has become one of the most famous pieces of modern art in the world. Not only that, on the open market, they reckon you could get up to a hundred million dollars for it now. So there. Right, let's see how they've got on. Stop painting now. It's an incredibly high standard. Um, what's your name? Will. Will, yours is the one that's got most energy. That's the one that feels most to me like Blue Poles does. So, Will, I declare you the winner. Give him a big hand, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Despite, or perhaps because of the controversy, the public flocked to see blue poles, turning Canberra into a destination for more than just politics. I'm now travelling forward three decades to meet another groundbreaking artist who transformed a city. Only this time, it was his hometown. At the dawn of the 21st century, Wellington was undergoing a dramatic change. What had long been New Zealand's administrative and political capital suddenly became an international movie-making hotspot. And I'm here to meet the man who made it happen. Peter. Tony. How are you doing, mate? In 2001, Kiwi film director Peter Jackson shot to fame with his highly acclaimed Lord of the Rings trilogy. But his great career had very humble beginnings. How old were you when you started messing around with making films? Well, my parents got um, given a Super 8 movie camera by a friend of theirs as a, as a Christmas present. And they didn't really know what to do with it. I mean, they weren't interested in movies. And, and, and I was an only child, so I had no competition. So I was able just to grab this camera and, and start experimenting and so I built models, cardboard, Thunderbird, rockets. From the age of seven or eight I, I never had any other career I wanted to follow other than filmmaking. Jackson followed his dream and began by making highly original low-budget films with his friends in and around the suburb of Miramar. Once we started to do a few movies we just thought well it would be great to have more of a permanent base so we cobbled together some money went into partnership with some friends of ours and we bought Camperdown Studios and that was the very first. Can yep. you show me a bit about this uh, wonderful suburb of yours? Absolutely. With each successful film Jackson bought another property and bit by bit his movie making empire grew. So what's here that belongs to you guys? Well, um, the first thing is actually this building right here, which used to be a, a, a home for wayward girls. Yeah. About um, 100 digital artists in that building. Do a lot of people who work for you live around here? We've got probably 1,500 people working for the digital company, Weta Digital, because that's a full time. And then when we're shooting a movie, there can be upwards of another 1,500, 2,000 people. Now, this has got to be you, isn't it, Weta? Yeah, now, this is basically Weta Workshop. But there was a fun fair here, wasn't there, at the turn of the century? Exactly where Weta Workshop is. Mm -hmm. 
It was called Miramar Wonderland. <laughs> the byline was the mecca for merry souls. It had a water slide. It had like an early kind of a bumpy roller coaster thing. I love the idea that where Weta Workshop is now it is an old theme park, the mecca of merry souls. I think that's so cool. Another local landmark, the Miramar Gasworks, has also been transformed into a state-of-the-art film studio. And that's not all. My two favourite parts of the filmmaking process are script writing, and then I love it in post-production, because you're sort of crafting the movie. There's another whole layer of invention goes on to try to make it into the best film that you can. What about the filming? I thought that's I what know, directors that's, did. That's the bit in the middle. No, 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 no. <laughs> of all the facilities, this is the jewel in Peter's Miramar crown. This is Park Road Post. Fairly splendid architecture. Yeah, it was actually built while we were doing The Lord of the Rings. We were kind of doing the movies and building this at the same time. <laughs> Ooh, Peter, this is absolutely splendid, isn't it? It's a great place to come to work, I've yeah. got to say. Plus the fact that we live five minutes away, so to get in your car and be at work in five minutes with not a single traffic light, no rush hour, that, that is just... That's, that's nice. It's a nice way to live. And you've managed to transform your own hometown in the process. Yeah. Not many people can say that. With a huge amount of help. Yeah. I mean, a lot of support. Well, thanks ever so much, Peter. Tony, you're very welcome. Cheers. OK, uh, then. <laughs> hey, take care. Thank you. Through his prodigious talent, Peter Jackson has created a thriving local film industry that's now world-renowned. But you don't have to be a famous movie director to get your art seen by the public. For my last time travel, I'm doing something a bit different. I'm heading back to the present to see if I can make an artistic mark of my own. Melbourne today is a thriving metropolis, a powerhouse of industry, culture and finance. But behind the scenes, it's quickly gaining an international reputation for something else. This lane is one of the most photographed spots in the whole of Melbourne. Why? Well, look at this. The whole place is a hymn to street art. For over a century, Melburnians steered clear of the city's dark, dingy laneways that were notorious for crime, prostitution and drugs. Ironically, it's been graffiti that's brought people back into them, with world-renowned artists like Banksy drawing in the crowds. So this is the Blender Studios uh, laneway, and it's uh, one of the most important street art laneways in, in Australia. It's, it's been preserved since 2002. You have examples of, say, Ha Ha's pieces here, his iconic Ned Kelly's, the, the Black Lorette, you know, this is, he's one of the most important street artists of our time. He'd put something like this on a canvas and it would be worth an extraordinary amount. Go on, tell me. Uh, maybe about $70,000. Then you've got like this uh, Mexican artist here, he's very famous. You've got Swoon, Pete Wolfganger, Elk. So how can I join this pantheon of great artists? Well, it just so happens that I happen to have a few uh, pre-cut stencils that you may have a look through and you can join this beautiful collage. Let's reveal it. Oh, yeah, hey! Yeah. <laughs> Show me something that's really special to you. I look at suburbia a lot, and so what I do is I go to, to the areas where they have the, the, the smoking areas at the bottom of the big skyscrapers. Oh, where everyone huddles together fagging. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And, and so what I'll do is uh, I'll go and I'll put this, put this in there, and I'll do it all in the same colours, and I'll make them all look exactly the same, and then I'll write on it, you are all the same. How many of those will you do? Maybe 50. 50? Yeah. yeah. They sit there and they, they read this thing, you know, you are all the same, and they, they think about their own identity. They throw their cigarette butt on the ground, they go upstairs, they quit their job and they change their lives. All because of you? Or, all because of art, I think. I believe art can change the world. I'm very romantic. That is great. I'm <laughs> off. See you later. <laughs> Thanks. I was a street art virgin and now I know what it's all about. Yeah, man. You're part of one of the best walls in Melbourne. Have an awesome day. But far from quitting my job, I'm more inspired than ever by art to go on. If there's one thing more than any other that demonstrates the transitory nature of street art, it's got to be right here. There's nothing, is there? Well, actually, 
there are four bolts here. The reason is that there used to be a Banksy sprayed onto this, but the owners of the building realized that it was quite valuable, so they fixed perspex over it in order to protect it. And then somebody came along with a tin of paint and tipped it down behind the perspex, wiped out the Banksy, and then sprayed the words, Banksy was ear over it which I reckon Banksy himself probably quite appreciated. When I started my time travels through the world of art and imagination, I certainly didn't think I'd end up in a graffiti-covered back alley, but looking around, it's the perfect place. Whether it's on canvas, the big screen, or a city sidewalk, the power of art shapes and challenges our world. And we all have a part to play.